Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association and uh, vice chair of the Norbanism Division, and I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, June 12th, we will hear the presentation Placemaking, Advanced Techniques for Programming and Design. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. If your question is for a particular speaker, please indicate so in your question. And we will answer your questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. Thanks to all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Colorado Chapter. To learn more about all of APA's chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. To learn about our divisions, visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these, please visit our new link, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, go to your dashboard on APA's website, select activities by provider. Again, today's provider is the Colorado chapter and select today's title. The webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. For availability of this, again, check out our webcast webpage at planning, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just hit up youtube.com slash planning webcast or just search planning webcast on YouTube. And a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, I'd now like to introduce today's speakers. All right, up first is Phil Merrick, and I hope I said this right because I didn't ask you, Phil, how to pronounce your last name. Uh, Phil leads the placemaking practice for MIG, a planning and design firm founded on research in human environments and environmental psychology. Prior to that, Phil worked for 18 years at the Pioneering Project for Public Spaces. Phil has helped to create some of the most dynamic urban projects in the country, including Discovery Green and Market Square in Houston, Pittsburgh Market Square, and many projects in downtown San Antonio. Phil is also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Next up is Jay Rankins. Jay has degrees from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, Purdue University, and Portland State University. Jay began his planning and design career as the transportation planner for Portland State University. He then worked for the city of Portland for two years in the transportation options division before joining MIG. He worked with the city focused on education, outreach, and policy planning to help support and promote active transportation and active living within the city of Portland. Throughout his years with MIG, Jay has worked with a diverse group of clients across the country that includes cities, counties, MPOs, downtown partnerships, redevelopment agencies, colleges, and universities. He has spoken at national and regional APA conferences and the Pacific Region SCUP Conference, 
convened sessions at the National SCUP Conference and facilitated working groups at the National Restreets Charette in Berkeley, California, and the local Charette held in Portland. Jay manages and uh, directs a variety of planning and design projects around the Northwest, along the West Coast, and within the Rocky Mountains West. He has worked with communities around the country, including the award-winning Charette Center City 2020 Vision Plan. He has worked with MIG for nine years, and last year uh, he assumed the role as director of the Denver area operations coming from Portland. And Jay is also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil so we can get this started. Phil. Thank you, Chris. Um, and it is Phil Myrick, by the way. No, uh, no problem with that, Chris. Phew. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Jay, Jay and I have been working together uh, for a few years at MIG, um, and we really wanted to bring some perspective on um, some new levels of placemaking that I think people don't uh, think of so much when they think of the term placemaking. You know, the, the term placemaking gets used far and wide these days, and it's it's a whole new era. And very exciting to see um, the the movement towards placemaking and the, the topic being central to so many conversations and so many conferences. Um, and I just want uh, to use this time to point out that the the places that you see uh, scrolling on your screen right now, um, their success really has depended on a much um, a somewhat deeper reading of placemaking than you typically see in these conversations. And that it goes back into some really fundamental working levels of, of making a place uh, work successfully. And so hopefully um, in today's presentation we can talk about what, what, those, what those levels are and talk about how you apply them to um, many levels of placemaking. So creating iconic places like you see a picture of Millennium Park or Discovery Green, say, but also retrofitting places that need, uh, that need uh, revitaliz revitalization, and then just improving everyday places. So, you know, building it into the fabric. And then, of course, we, we also, we think of placemaking, we also do this. You know, this is the kind of uh, movement that in some ways has, has taken over the much of the placemaking conversation about being experimental and being uh, um, lighter, quicker, cheaper, as PPS calls it, or tactical, as other people call it. And that's great too. I just, I, I um, this won't be the focus of today. I think that's getting plenty of attention. I, I really want to draw us back to some of the, some of the deeper, deep, deeper levels. So today's presentation, we're we're going to start with looking at why places matter, what what's so important about about this movement, and then we're going to talk about how places work at this fundamental level, and then look at some elements of place. And how the community, how community insight becomes a really uh, informative uh, piece of information that gets worked in, and how this all wraps together into developing a space program, which we think is vital to the success of a place. So, just backing up to uh, our first segment, uh, why do places matter? So, uh, I think we have a lot of uh, educated, highly educated planners on um, on the call today on the webcast, um, and you have probably read articles and seen sessions that delve into this in, uh, in much more depth. So I'll just briefly cover some of the basics here um, as context. Um, more and more people are talking about the new economy and economies of place where um, rather than uh, moving to a job, jobs are moving to places to follow people. And people are picking their places. And this map just shows some of the demogra demographic migration that goes on. And so, you know, in a sense, America picks up and moves uh, quite frequently. And everybody who does so has some kind of a checklist, um, what they're looking for in a community. And these, you could say all of America has a, has a checklist. And more and more studies being done about what, what that checklist entails, what's on that checklist. So for example, a survey that you might have seen done by the National Realtors Association a, a couple years ago found that more and more people are looking for great neighborhoods as, as more important than just the size of the house. 
So looking for amenities at the place neighborhood scale rather than just in the house. 77% was a, a neighborhood with sidewalks and places to walk to. Um, and that place is right next to high quality schools. So it's, it's really become a very fundamental thing that people are looking for that's on their checklist. So if you don't have these things, obviously um, you're, you're risking people moving somewhere else. Another study that's really quite seminal at this point is the, the Knight Foundation and the Soul of the Community study. Um, which, which was a, a study of what makes people love where they live and why does that matter. So, um, and they actually came to a, a fairly definitive conclusion. And I, I think this was a study that encompassed about 40,000 people. So it's really a very good study, one of the best that we have. But the three most salient um, factors that people are looking for when they choose a community or, or if, they, if they really feel deep affection for a community are social offerings. Um, so that covers everything from places to go, people to meet, um, nice uh, offering of community events, arts and culture. Um, and then the second thing is the sense of openness. So is this, is this community welcoming to me? And me can define you know, a diverse group of people. And do we all feel like this community is accepting to us? And then aesthetics was actually quite high on the list. So when people look at a community, they recognize they they're they're very good at understanding a good place. Um, you know, you could say, uh, I know one when I see one. I know a good place when I see one. Um, and I think you know part of this session is to get beyond that and and understand, you know, what is it exactly about that place that you like. And so the way that this uh, is playing out is, of course. Um, generational and the the boomers together with the millennials make up approximately half of the current population and they happen to be the two groups that are the most interested in the communities that offer these aspects of um, uh, social togetherness and interesting places to go and walkability so um, as I'm sure you've noticed, every community is jumping on the bandwagon to become more walkable and to attract these people and to get on these lists, hopefully, of you know the best places to live, of which there are uh, too many to, to, to list. Uh, but it, it's always instructive to look at what, these, what cities are on these lists. And when, one thing I've found is that a lot of them are mid-sized cities that offer a lot of lifestyle amenity but also have great access to the outdoors. Brookings, of course, has also, um, and others have been terrific resources looking at uh, why place matters in terms of economics, dollars and cents. So uh, you can read their reports about the increased value brought to office rents, retail rents, home values, just to be in a walkable neighborhood. And uh, other studies have shown during the downturn even um, those neighborhoods maintained their their home values much better than in the farther out neighborhoods that are more suburban or less walkable, less transit oriented. Um, so, you know, here's here's where we get to shift into how, how do you you know if if place if if creating great places that people feel attached to is so important, um, what are some new ways that we can think about creating those? And one one way to think about it is that we're creatures, and we have habitats just like other creatures. And to create a comfortable habitat is really what, what it means to create a high-performing place. Um, and if you, if you evaluate some of the great sidewalk scenes and street scenes and destinations in either your city or some place that you visited, um, one thing that you'll find that they that you know, you'll come away remembering is that they all are full of people. And so creating these people places is obviously a central part of what it means to create a great place. And in fact, to get all of the bang for the buck, all of those all of those rewards, all that return on investment that is broken down by Brookings Institution and, and other folks is to really uh, succeed in social in creating social gathering places. So all those economic outcomes come from this more fundamental outcome 
that um, you know to nourish healthy human social activity. It's the it's the absolute number one goal, and how we get all that potential out of our downtowns and neighborhoods. So, how do we do this? How do places work? And that's that's what I'd like to go in a little deeper on this idea of habitat. So, you know, I think we really have to start by seeing our, ourselves as creatures with certain innate uh, motivations and needs and habits. So many people will, you know, tell you in detail about the environment that a Western lowland gorilla needs, for example, to, to, to be healthy and, and to thrive. There are fewer people who can tell you in the same detail about what we need as creatures. And um, so that has been uh, part of my career path over the years. And uh, have recently really enjoyed looking back at the past of uh, the the past 50 years or so of research um, that is is uh, is behind you know that that's that same research level of understanding us as Homo sapiens and so when we look at our exemplary habitat and this is just one picture that I could have picked from my from my pictures from around the world this happens to be Copenhagen so. We look at this, and we instantly feel at home. We instantly feel good, and um, and what I like to do is start to pick up pick apart successful places and really understand at the functional level what are the things that are going on here that are making it work for people. And so here, you know, we can say that we've got places to eat, we've got windows to look in, room to roam. Um, every species needs a certain range, right? Um, water ledges to sit on, benches, benches to sit on, uh, cultural interest. So this is a very rich environment. And um, as I mentioned, there is such a wealth of research that dates back to the 50s and 60s and through till today. Um, some of it falls under environmental psychology. Uh, some of it is called um, environmental uh, ecological psychology, uh, Roger Barker. I'm, I've personally been inspired by some of these folks like um, Susan Goldsman and Robin Moore and Richard Louv, looking at our needs for access to nature, also in an urban environment. William H. White, of course, has done so many studies that have been incorporated into placemaking today, but also you know, these unsung heroes like Robert Sumner, Roger Barker, um, James Gibson. And so I've, I've picked out two or three of these folks, and I, I hope that understanding the work and where they're coming from really brings some new dimensions. So I'd like to start with Roger Barker. He's, he's one of my heroes. He, he, in the 1950s, he and a team of researchers actually um, sent a team out to a small town in Iowa, which was unnamed in his book One Boy's Day, but I think it has since uh, been identified as Oskaloosa. And what they did was they actually studied a boy. This isn't the boy. This is the boy that I studied one, once. But it was a similar project, actually following him around from the time he woke up at 7 AM to the time he went to bed and literally wrote down everything he said and did. And uh, there was a team of about eight different researchers. And they actually they, they would split up. They, they were in teams of two. And they stayed with him for 30 minutes because it was such a focused exercise of writing down what he did. And then they would switch to a fresh team. And you know, you can imagine it's a little bit comical that these these researchers followed this kid to school and on his way home from school and how he played with the yard. And here's the record that they got. And it's it's um, these detailed level annotations. So on page 41, he jumped up on a retaining wall, right? And then later on, he picked up a baseball bat. At some point, he climbed up on the railing of a bandstand. He hid behind the bushes, et cetera, picked up a lid of a can, sailed it through the air, page 401. So um, you know, I hope you have a smile on your face, because it's, it's almost unfathomable that there's a book out there that goes past 400 pages describing in this minute level of detail what a boy of about eight years old did all day. And it really is fascinating. And it, it, you know, has gotten me thinking about um, how do we, how do our urban environments serve kids, but also us as adults. 
and how do we create these absorbing uh, environments that make it possible for us to have fun and for us to really um, meet each other in these wonderful places. Some follow-up researchers um, took apart the book One Boy's Day and they started to uh, label all of the affordances that are discussed in, in that book. And I'll explain a little bit more about affordances in a minute. But basically, uh, there are climb-onable features, which included a railing of a bandstand, a garage in the backyard, Yes, he climbed on the garage roof, um, a bench, a crate, and then, for example, walk onable ledges. So that includes retaining walls, uh, ledge around the courthouse, house, et cetera. And one thing that Barker pointed out, and other researchers have since, is that a child's grasp of the world is by the things they know what they can do with. So, so there's the house with the dog that bites, the place where the fair is, um, the sliding hill. So they may not know the proper names of these things. They see everything in terms of its usability. And of course, they're most any any other researcher of children will tell you these are the number one um, activities for young children. So they're constantly looking for something to climb on, swing on, hide behind, spaces to run, etc. And I think, you know, you look at the joy of a child like this picture shows and how immersed she is in her environment and how lost she is in pleasure. I think it's very much uh, time to think about how do these ideas help us study ourselves as adults and not just children and, and bring that, that level of thinking to designing walkable environments. And I think. You know, there's so much being done on walkable environments. Um, uh, the Urban Thoroughfares uh, Manual, the NACTO Street Design Manual, um, walkability checklists and audits, all, all kinds of tools and resources out there, which, which is terrific. Um, but I also want to start to talk more about how do walkable environments um, invite activity. And so those ING gerund verbs are so important, walking slowly, walking quickly, socializing, sitting, stopping, eating, drinking, looking. Um, when we want to predict success of a place, like a successful streetscape, for example, we need to be able to communicate and design around terms like this about what are people going to be able to do here and what are the affordances for them. And that's, that's how we get to great successful places and successful streetscapes. And it can also be very much uh, driven towards outcomes. And so we can talk about specific goals that we have, let's say, to bring new families downtown. So then what are the behaviors that those people would want in their downtown, and how do we accommodate those? So the theory of affordances is uh, one of J.J. Gibson's big contributions to this field. And what he said was, and, and followed up by, by Don Norman, um, uh, who took it to industrial design, and what they both said is that an object like a doorknob or a jug offers you an affordance. It, it affords you an opportunity to do something. So a doorknob, you can turn the doorknob to open the door. A jug, you can fill it with water and lift it and pour it. And a well-designed object clearly communicates it, its affordance. What does this thing do? It has an answer immediately and intuitively ready for you. Now, if we start to apply this to urban streetscapes, I would ask you, what does this street do? And you know, for all of us who wander around cities taking pictures and take pictures like this of you know, the, the, the bad alongside the good, I, I think this is a really important concept to, to think about when you're framing your understanding of, well, why does this street perform so poorly. Um, and again, open spaces too. So this is a very green space that's well maintained. But what exactly does it do? Is it, is it affording you any opportunity? Would that boy who woke up in Oskaloosa, Iowa, have anything to do in e either of these environments? And then extrapolating that, would you? Um, a few years ago, I was invited to Disney World to do a little bit of um, uh, consulting. and one of the things that was very clear to me is that 
Main Street USA has this richness of affordances that, you know, every few feet, and in some cases even closer together, you have some interesting new element that is touchable, graspable, uh, you know, you can look at, you can pick up, you can go into. It's, it's just very, very rich environment in that way. And the Disney folks were telling me how much trouble they had with Epcot Center, especially for children, but really for everybody in terms of the length of stay and um, then being able to understand how to use that environment and how to go from one place to the next. And the kids would just tire out very quickly in Epcot Center versus Main Street. Objects also broadcast their affordances. So, you know, a step is for climbing, steps are for climbing. And you see it and you immediately understand that. But these things are all relative. So the affordance is relative to the user and their abilities. So why is this important? Well, for one thing, um, there has been a revolution in uh, the interface design world and website design and industrial design. And these folks who designed the iPhone and all kinds of other you remember what old smartphones used to be like and how clunky they were and how difficult they were to use. Part of Steve, Steve Jobs' genius was to make it intuitive and to make it user friendly. And uh, so the theory of affordances, if you, if you search it on the internet, you'll find it's being used extensively in video gaming, user interface design. Uh, Bill Morridge uses it in his book, which has really become a, very quickly become a classic, Designing Interactions, all about interaction design. And think back a few years, maybe 10, 10 or 12 years, um, when uh, the World Wide Web was pretty fresh and designers were trying to figure out, how do we get the public to understand they can click on this? And so they went through all kinds of iterations of, of designing buttons. And you know, more and more looking like a button and more and more feeling intuitive, like, oh, that looks like something like a button that I should click on. And so getting more and more into, into better and better design. <clears throat> and how do you apply this to placemaking? Environments that motivate exploration and provide a multitude of cues that encourage us to use them are going to be successful environments. And so um, Don Norman, whom I also mentioned before, who took the idea of affordances to industrial design, um, he had this great quote, we are all detectives searching for clues to enable us to function in this complex world, whether it's flags waving in the wind or footprints in the fields that suggest paths to follow, we search for significant signs in the world that offer us guidance. Um, and so you start to think, so, so now when I look at a streetscape, so this is a, this is a small street um, almost around the corner from me. Um, I now, when I look at, a, at any kind of place, I, I start to see flags waving in the wind, right? It's very much to me now sort of getting to this level of, well, what are the affordances here? And what are the cues? And so you can start, it's a very useful way to, to do one level of evaluation. And so you can ask yourself now, you can start, you can start to quantify even how successful is this street? Um, not bad. It's a lot better than that other one that I showed. But you compare it to a more rich environment. So it might not be quite fair to compare any street to uh, Pearl Street in Boulder uh, because it's, it's so exceptional. But you can see here how many flags are waving in the wind, how many affordances there are for all types of people, and how um, successfully those are communicated to us. And then you start to think about, OK, um, when is this not uh, applied so successfully? Here's a retail building, a mixed-use building, you know, trying to, it reminds me of the early phases of web design. I'm a retail building, believe me, but it's not believable. And we can really start to look at why that is so and, and what are the additional layers that need to be programmed into this building to be convincing. Um, last summer, I was, I was in Brattleboro, Vermont, and I took a series of pictures of uh, these three friends who were um, standing at a crosswalk. And this is right downtown. So pretty busy location on a Saturday. And it was amazing to see that um, they were enjoying their environment so much that um, they, 
they really stayed there. I actually watched them uh, socialize and stand by this pole through about five different light cycles as people streamed past them and towards them and almost knocked into them. And it was just a fascinating example of how one street will work so well for people that they don't even want to leave the light pole. And so Great Street is like a world in miniature that induces us to explore. Um, so what are some of the other elements? Uh, the, these, these are elements that I use um, whenever I'm working on a major public space or, or a small public space. Um, and they are some elements that run through program, uh, what I call stickiness, which is really about affordances, mining the existing patterns and flows, and creating comfort, explorability, and shapeability. So the program scaffold. Um, by program, I don't mean an event. I mean anything that affords us something to do. So um, it's any kind of attraction uh, falls into program. And uh, so it could be a, a food kiosk. It could be a bench offers us a place to sit in the shade. Um, those are all program elements. And when we're trying to attract people and create a habitat, we really need multiple levels of program. And so I call that the program scaffold. And it can, it can start, depending on the scale that you're working with, um, it can start by looking at large-scale attractions that anchor activities. So that could be a, you know, a park or an anchor store or a retail district or some other destination space. This is uh, La Rambla in Barcelona, which obviously is a huge draw. Um, Fountain Square in Cincinnati, another example of those iconic anchor attractions. But then the everyday uses that are between are, I think, um, unsung heroes of getting social activity to occur in our cities. And I call them the breadcrumb trail. So it's all the, all the little stuff that is sprinkled through our downtowns or not, um, and that are, are hopefully um, intelligently arranged. So, you know, just showing you one example of, of a breadcrumb in Bryant Park uh, that, that just offers a little bit of interest. And then it's really important to look at the adjacencies. So how are these things combined? And so you know, an anchor attraction like La Boqueria in Barcelona um, is right there next to uh, you know, the local shops. And even I see a Dunkin' Donuts there. So the point being, um, compressing these elements together creates much more energy and much more success than if they're strung out and, and spread around uh, with too much space in between. Stickiness is this idea that um, every streetscape, every place, could have a level of affordance for us that, um, for the most part, goes unevaluated in, in the project that we design and build. So how, how rich are we being in our treatment of places to sit, places to lean, uh, places to hang out? Um, you know, in in Siena, uh, the famous the camp, the campo, the, the the main plaza there, these bollards are an absolute um, magnet for people throughout the day, but especially in the evening. And I'm not sure what initially uh, required the placement of bollards there. Maybe it was because of the famous horse race that takes place in this in this plaza once a year. Um, but they have become part of the stickiness of this place. So by sticky, I mean, does it attract people? Is it a magnet? Is it hard to leave? Um, slippery places are, are quite the opposite. They, they're like that poor retail building. I wouldn't even slow down um, at that building um, because I immediately perceive that there's very little there. There's a paucity of activities and affordances there. So being sticky is this very desirable trait. And we can use the idea of affordances uh, to sprinkle around uh, elements. And it's very much like a coral reef. So for example, I am told when you dive, when you go deep sea diving in the ocean, um, you don't see a lot of fish in most of the open water. But as soon as you get to a reef or something like a reef, that's where all the fish are. And we're really not that much different. And the picture. Uh, below is Union Square in Manhattan, and it's just an interesting 
uh, uh, picture because you can see the more open plaza spaces which people are crossing, but they stick to these little crevices and these ledges and these poles, and um, they, you know, we as a creature attach ourselves to things, and so this is a this is a um, a fundamental fact that we can use in design uh, and that we can watch out for. Um, we're not to place these affordances for people if, if it's a place where um, gathering people isn't, isn't what, what we want to do. What I call pattern mining is this idea that there are natural traffic flows and congestion points and we can really, we, we need to look at those and evaluate them and use them to our advantage. Um, and so if we look at this location in Brattleboro, Vermont, um, we can think, you know, there's, it's, it's been shown that people, and this is William H. White's work, by the way, people love, pe people tend to stand at junctions and corners, especially where there are heavy uh, pedestrian flows. They like to be in the thick of it, in the thick of the activity. But you can also see some of the other stuff that's happening here. Behind those people is a nice affordance to sit on, which is also an entrance, which is a major um, entrances are where people, where those flow, those natural flows happen. And of course, there's there's windows to look in, um, and there's uh, there's a whole variety of it's a very nice selection of just the kinds of things that we as a species are looking for. And I use this approach um, sometimes to look forward. So this is an evaluation of the Spokane Transit Center design, which I worked on recently. And this new design, we we predicted what the flows would be, and then we started to look for at those at those bright orange locations, well, here's where we can bring them a little breadcrumb. So whether it's wayfinding and signage or food and drink or seating um, or just a place to, to uh, do some people watching, we're, we're knowledgeable about the space and how it's going to work and we're intentional about being able to create the activity that we think would be really positive in this place. And I just, um, you know, would tip my hat to Christopher Alexander, and for those of you who are fans of his work, A Pattern Language, he talks about this in similar ways, finding the natural centers of circulation, uh, the confluences, but also the tributaries, and look for the opportunities to Im improve and add to the pedestrian experience, and then make these places positive, and then embellish this new path with, with new centers. So that's another way to think about this. And then the idea of creating comfort and um, just uh, you know, to quickly go through this, the idea of amenities is uh, more than just places to sit and, and, you know, all of these other factors really come into play. Um, but it's got to be about creating environments. And so the right combination of, of ingredients and affordances and comfort will very often, and it's in the right location following the patterns, very often provide all the clues that you need for what solution to move towards when you're when you're looking at a space that you're planning or designing. And then just keeping in mind also, so much research has been done about um, people's natural experience of nature. Rachel Kaplan, the experience of nature, really um, uh, spent years studying uh, what environments people are attracted to and, and you know, what combination of enclosure and openness and visibility and secrecy and these explorable environments are a, a summation of, I think, what, what that research points towards. And so, you know, we're constantly looking for opportunities to explore, use our, use our brains and our bodies together um, to, to find new surprises. And so there's so many things that we can use to provide that, uh, that sense of surprise. And of course, um, art can often be one part of that and why it's, why it's so attractive to us. And then shapeability. So we need, we need to be part of this space, right? As a user, we don't want to be over-prescripted. We want to bring something ourselves to a space and be able to um, make an impact on the space um, you know, these folks actually brought their own furniture and their own chess set because they wanted to use 
uh, that's how they wanted to use the space, and nobody told them no, and that's a great thing. But obviously, we can also provide more of that uh, appropriate seating for them and think about um, how people can shape their own space just through a movable chair and be able to define their space. But also, clearly, events and being open to uh, different groups who want to use the space builds ownership. And it builds the sense of this being theirs. And, and those are the people who will be coming back to that space. Um, and finally, none of this can happen in a Petri dish. So I talk a lot about the research that's been done and um, my own observations and other people's. But uh, it, it can be dry as a bone without having direct, active, hands-on engagement with the community. So, um, all the work that I do with public spaces is heavily involved in asking people, you know, what would they want to do, um, not, not just in uh, this kind of setting, which we're all familiar with, but also in the setting as it exists and, and studying what they do do. And so this is activity mapping of um, where people used, uh, what, what parts of this playground uh, kids used throughout the course of a day, and this was Every, every red dot is a person. And so really understanding it on that level. And obviously using other uh, techniques for interaction, um, uh, which we use quite often in our, in our projects, to understand where people are going, how they're getting there, the routes that they take, and then collecting their, their input online as well. So going back to that idea of if, we, if one goal is to attract families with children to move downtown, um, really looking at what is the data that can help us get there, and not just surveys and, and online maps and workshops, but also very specific focus groups and market data. There's a great deal of market data that's out there uh, that doesn't get employed into creating great places, that, that doesn't get folded into creating a, a program for a place. Um, with that, Jay, I want to pass it over to you and uh, have you talk a little bit about some of the programming that you have done in Denver. Okay. Here's the presentation of the final guy. Okay, uh, thanks, Bill. Um, and uh, I guess what we wanted to talk about here is just a, a little bit of a case study uh, as far as how we apply some of these principles on a specific project. Uh, so very recently, um, we're actually wrapping up, you can see the date here, uh, March 2015, we sort of um, finalized the project and uh, it's now moving forward in a couple different manners that I'll speak to. Hey Jay, uh, there was, sorry to I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind um, speaking up a little bit or getting a little bit closer to your speakerphone? Yes. How's oh, that? that's beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so uh, yeah, just to recap really quickly. So we developed an urban design framework for a portion of Denver uh, that uh, is trying to capitalize on sort of an, a very quickly evolving community. Uh, we're one of the fastest growing communities in the in the country and that's in a lot of different forms uh, in terms of jobs, number of housing units, uh, there's some negatives to that in terms of affordability and different aspects that the community is trying to grapple with but there's also some really great things in that there's n new development in areas that have been uh, relatively untouched uh, previously. There's redevelopment occurring and revitalization of some pretty critical aspects of the city. Um, this is, so we looked at, uh, in essence, the theater district. Um, that is a, uh, it's actually sort of a designated boundary where there's, um, you know, some different zoning. Um, there's a, an oversight structure with representation. Um, but Usually what people think about is the Denver Performing Arts Complex, which is what we're looking at here. 
uh, and uh, I'll show you some images in a second of the uh, Colorado Convention Center. So uh, the Performing Arts Complex uh, is made up of several different venues, uh, a parking structure, which you're seeing on the left-hand side of this image, uh, and uh, a park space. And this, what we're looking at sort of as a centerpiece of this image is the Galleria. So it's a covered uh, open space that sort of uh, is intended to connect all of these different venues. Uh, this is when it's in, you know, when there's an event happening, uh, when there's a couple of shows going on, matinees, a uh, very vibrant, exciting place. The issue is when there's not a show going on, there's very little reason to be there otherwise. Uh, there's, it's a very fixed structure to, so to Phil's point about flexibility, um, it's nearly lacking entirely. Um, and there's not a lot of, again, reasons to be there, not a lot of affordances, uh, to use uh, Phil's terms. Um, this is a, uh, you can sign to see, and I'll use a pointer here, this is the Galleria. So we're now uh, south of the space. Uh, this is the back of one of the theater complexes, the back of another theater facility, and this is Sculpture Park. Again, uh, not a lot of flexibility in that space while, yeah, there's a little ample, ample space to kind of roam. Um, not a lot of seating options, uh, not a lot of activity spaces. Um, it is used for events, and I'll show you a few, a few photos of that, um, but it's a pretty costly endeavor uh, to sort of retrofit it to accommodate those types of uses. This is the front of the Colorado Convention Center. Uh, received some improvements about 15 years ago where there was a brand new uh, kind of front entry put on, a lot of investment put on one side of the convention center uh, to make it a more lively, exciting place with places to sit, places to gather, uh, thinking about some of those uh, kind of funnel points, uh, points of entry, uh, bringing in different modes, accommodating uh, transit, uh, bikes, uh, but largely uh, the center, again, is activated when there's a, a large conference uh, or a large meeting, uh, but there's not a lot of reason to go there uh, when those are not occurring. So uh, in essence, what we have is about 22 uh, acres of downtown Denver, um, geographically near the center of the city, very close to the center of the city, that has two uses. Uh, so when we talk about a mix of uses, uh, a reason to be a pl in a place, and sort of activation across the day, across a week, around you know the, uh, different months of the calendar, uh, there's not a lot of reasons to be there when there's not either a performance or a conference going on. So the urban design framework was developed from November to February. Uh, there are now two teams working on master plans for the arts complex and for the convention center. So the purpose of the urban design framework was to identify what are the issues and what are the solutions that need to be considered in these master planning efforts. So uh, we're actually, uh, MIG is working on the Cal Auto Convention Center master plan. And then uh, we are uh, coordinating with a team led by H3, uh, an architecture firm out of New York City. Uh, who's working on the Denver uh, Arts Complex uh, or Performing Arts Complex Master Plan. And so both are considering a lot of the things that I'll show you here. Um, this, is, this is representing those two sites. So here's the Convention Center. Here is the uh, Performing Arts Complex. Uh, this is a large uh, multi-use cam or multi-tenant campus, uh, three different large users. Uh, and But in between, we have uh, Spear Boulevard, uh, approximately 60,000 vehicles a day traveling along this boulevard. There is, it's a split boulevard, um, so you might be able to see through the blue here that there's uh, one-way traffic here, one-way traffic here, and there's a creek and trails that go down the middle. Uh, over here is the 16th Street Mall, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Denver. Uh, it's a car-free uh, pedestrian mall uh, that has uh, free shuttle service, rubber tire, um, shuttle service, transit service running up and down it. Uh, the different boxes are representing all the different projects uh, that are happening right now. So there's either recently completed, happening concurrently, or about to happen plans looking at all these different things that are shaded in blue and purple. 
And so right at the heart of that is the theater district or uh, the convention center and performing arts complex. So the vision for the area that we developed working with a variety of stakeholders and uh, representatives from the community was uh, to create an unforgettable visitor experience brimming with cultural and educational enrichment opportunities. So while that might seem, I don't know, maybe a little generic, it was pretty strategic uh, how that vision was even crafted. So one was the unforgettable piece of it, so tapping into emotion. Uh, thinking about how people are feeling, the memories that are created, um, whether it be those short-term memories or lifelong memories. Uh, the visitor experience, putting that front and center. So thinking about the user uh, and you know us as creatures, as, as Phil was saying, and how do we stimulate um, and activate an environment uh, with thinking about the user first, um, their entire experience associated with this place. Um, and making it a place and a series of sort of sub-places. And then the brimming with cultural and educational enrichment opportunities, the cultural and educational is reflecting sort of the, the current uh, programming of those spaces, uh, but the brimming is about spilling out. You know, there's a lot of great things happening even when it seems as though these facilities are um, kind of dead from the public realm perspective. Uh, but if we can, you know, create more transparency, uh, have different things spill out, um, we can begin to activate that and attract then other users and uses, uh, such as a residential development, maybe hotel development, hospitality, uh, even office users to the area. So there were six goals that were outlined, enhancing arrival and departure. Uh, so again, from that user uh, experience perspective, thinking all the way about you know how people enter a space, how they get to a space, and the emotion and attitude that uh, is sort of generated um, already before you even get to somewhere. So how are you thinking about that arrival? And then uh, while some people are cognizant of that, they often forget about the departure experience. So uh, you know, is it easy for people to get transportation, get to transportation, figure out where they need to go when they are in fact leaving? And then really trying to create these play reasons to stay in play. Uh, next is exposing and celebrating the existing programs and uses. Uh, so performances, absolutely, but also educational opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of large institutions, and that's in that sense what we're talking about is probably some of our tougher um, things to tackle in our communities are these larger boxes, uh, whether it be um, retail, uh, it could be cultural institutions like I'm discussing here in this example, um, schools perhaps, um, you know, can have pretty large footprints. And so they tend to have these uh, blank walls, at least, you know, you have maybe a, a primary entrance that is really nice and celebrated, but the other entrances then suffer or forgotten. And so uh, looking for ways to celebrate what's happening on the inside. Uh, strengthening physical and functional connections to other areas. Uh, so we're not relying solely on the programming of this space, but that we're looking at how do you traverse, how do you connect. Uh, to other activity centers, uh, and so again, using Phil's terminology, what are those breadcrumbs uh, that get you from place to place? And uh, you've all probably experienced when you're walking through, uh, a, say, a downtown environment, and you're walking along a cool main street, and there's very active uses, uh, new uh, stimulus uh, every you know so many feet, or at least every storefront. And then you get to a surface parking lot. And you may walk even a shorter distance than you did previously along the area that was very activated. Um, but you're well aware of that. You're not willing to walk those extra few feet. Uh, and uh, it becomes uh, an area, or you end up turning around. It doesn't make you uh, move on to the next space. Uh, di diversifying and maximizing the mix of uses and potential visitors. So that was another piece of it, is the fact that there's two uses on this in very large site resulted in you know a very narrow sort of slice of users as well and so by looking at the programming bringing in additional uses the intent wasn't you know simply to, so that we could say it's mixed use it was to diversify the mix of users make it a true social gathering place reflective of our entire community not just a small slice of that community uh, building on and leveraging economic development opportunities uh, really the intent there was that we are creating uh, opportunities for and supporting um, not only these large institutions but also 
the small and medium business-sized community uh, in Denver and beyond. And then finally, integrating and respecting Colorado's natural environment. Uh, so that goes for low-impact development, but also, uh, as you'll see in the upcoming slides, really trying to celebrate the fact um, that of the context of this place, that there's the, the front range, the Rocky Mountains, there, there's this outdoor recreation uh, kind of vibe and um, sort of undercurrent to the, to the community and the culture here. Uh, so some of the issues and opportunities, we sliced and diced it in uh, terms of urban design, access and connectivity and programming. And this will go uh, relatively quickly here. Um, so I won't get into all the nuance, but happy to answer any questions when we get to the Q&A. Uh, so when we're talking about those large boxes, one of the, uh, I think, major things that most people have already tuned into is you end up with large blank walls and edge con conditions that contribute to an unattractive public realm. And so we were brainstorming ways to uh, sort of combat that and activate some of these uh, blank walls. Uh, so some are exposing the existing back of house activities, um, which you can see here, uh, which is showing rehearsal spaces, um, really sort of permeability, transparency, uh, showing the, sh you know, the uh, construction shops for sets, uh, set design. Uh, but then also bringing in other uses, such as uh, we're exploring an art school at the DPAC site. Uh, we're looking at uh, perhaps a brewery uh, at the convention center site uh, along the edges there. Uh, but also uh, then looking at uh, add, adding these active round four uses. So the brewery would be one example of that, uh, shopping obviously. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. We're showing parklets here. Um, and then you can see the, the concept for the Miami Beach Convention Center, which one of our partners is working on, uh, where they're actually looking at creating a promenade there with shopping. And then some more creative ways. You know, there's, there are necessarily some blank edges to things. You know, if, there's, if behind a wall is the, the seating for a theater, well, you're not going to punch that open and create a large window there. So what are some opportunities? So one could be programming. This is a live wall sculpture on the left. Um, that was actually a performance sort of art piece uh, that was uh, transcended, a, a, I think, a week long there. Uh, green walls, art, uh, and then using technology to our advantage as well uh, for display walls, interactive video walls, things like that. Um, next, looking at the rooftops and how do we activate some of the rooftop spaces. So we're actually, as part of the master planning process for the convention center, <coughs> excuse me, looking at expanding up uh, from that convention center. Um, so obviously thinking about the ground floor, but what are those opportunities once you get above that ground plane, um, not only on rooftops, but balconies and, and things that help to even further activate the streetscape environment. Uh, so rooftop terraces, uh, looking at uh, different ways to connect the uses at grade as well as above grade. Uh, looking at uh, amenities and events in those spaces. Uh, existing outdoor spaces, as I mentioned before, lack flexibility amenities. And so we're looking at different things like improving the existing spaces to better support outdoor programming events. So that's everything from thinking about the climatic conditions and you know, should there be coverings for different times of year, whether that be from sun or, or snow, uh, perhaps, with you know, the right heating elements or uh, shade um, as well. And so uh, I, I think I said sun and snow, but rain and snow is what I meant. And then, yeah, shading from the sun. Uh, but then also utilities, um, thinking about hardscape and softscape, the flexibility of that space. Uh, I don't think anyone wants just a solid hardscape plaza space, um, but you need to be really cognizant about how then you place uh, landscape elements and, you know, can there be movable planters? Can things be situated in a way where you know, you can, there are three or four or even five different ways that you can configure and program a space moving forward. Um, encouraging activity when no formal programming of events are occurring. So fountains are one way to do that. And this is that Copenhagen, Copenhagen Square example, uh, where there are reasons to be there even when there's not a program. Um, we're seeing more recent uh, kind of contemporary examples where you have the, the kind of the spout fountains coming out of uh, the surface of a plaza space that can turn off when uh, you want to put maybe market booths, things like that up. 
but thinking about all the different times of day, uh, all the different times of week, and when it's uh, formal programming is and not, and how do we activate a space? Uh, designing and gathering space is a foster play, and allow for flexibility and discovery. So, just being playful and realizing that play isn't just for children. Um, thinking across the lifespan, how do we get people to play? And some of that's you know very formally. We're showing a water slide down the middle of the street or, or trampolines on the sidewalk, but um, it can be more subtle things. Like I said, the video wall. Uh, we've seen that you know older couples, children, uh, families, you know, so everyone across the lifespan uh, can interact with different elements of the of the environment. Uh, the vacant and underutilized properties adjacent to these facilities also provide uh, sort of opportunities. Uh, in large part, they are inactive now because they're responding to these blank walls. But as we're thinking at a more comprehensive level, uh, sort of approaching these spaces, how do we uh, engage them and make sure that they're all working together? And so exploring convertible and programmable open spaces in the short term. Uh, so. Uh, different examples of how to convert a space here, but testing adaptive reuse and redevelopment opportunities, so really building on the existing fabric and, and different ways to incorporate that and enliven it, and then encouraging adjacent uses with appeal to visitors and residents. So uh, one of the things that we realized is that even the performing arts complex, which is a, a great asset for the Denver community, the majority of patrons are driving to the center from uh, either an outlying neighborhood or an outlying community. Uh, in the convention center, the majority of the traffic, unless it's a, a trade show, uh, which happens a few times a year, that attracts, it would be like the home and garden show where it attracts a lot of local residents. Most of those people are actually from out of state. And so creating reasons for uh, residents to be here too. So again, just sort of increasing the diversity of uses. Um, and what is more Colorado than in Denver than the people of Denver and Colorado? So providing reasons for them to want to be in this space is really important. Uh, the Galleria uh, lacks activity, as I said earlier. So looking at different ways to enhance the facades and, and storefronts, exploring vertical activation of those upper levels, as we mentioned previously, uh, integrating public art and lighting uh, into the space, and creating spaces for events and activities. And there's actually uh, as part of the DPAC master planning effort, they're reconsidering uh, that kind of fixed raised plaza and thinking about taking it back to more of a traditional streetscape environment. Um, so it's funny how some of these things evolve and, and cycle through time, what's in vogue and what's not. Um, and then uh, finally on the urban design front, and then we'll breeze through the rest here, but leveraging the growing draw and appeal of Denver and Colorado. So how can we use materials in both indoor and outdoor spaces? Can we integrate outdoor activities into the facility design uh, in terms of uh, perhaps climbing walls, pump tracks? Uh, and we're looking at that for both facilities actually as part of the master plans. Uh, thinking about the site layout and the permeability that we're talking about in terms of um, you know looking out through windows, through outdoor spaces, uh, but giving you that, that sense of place uh, by really grounding you, and then bringing in uh, retail and restaurant spaces with local flavor. The access and connect connectivity really fast here is uh, looking at pedestrian connectivity, uh, identifying features that promote watering and identity, um, looking at uh, that entry environment, right-sizing streets, uh, connections, that's, so creating program spaces and signature streets um, that's, you know, where what's happening on a particular site can spill out beyond. And so sometimes people call those fingers, uh, you know, that extend beyond a certain place. Uh, so we're looking for opportunities. Improving wayfinding and signage. Uh, and then we were, I mentioned Spear Boulevard. It's one of the uh, highest uh, accident locations uh, in downtown Denver and probably the region. Uh, and so looking at how do we create a safer environment for pedestrians, bicycles, uh, and transit users? Uh, how do we uh, embrace that edge? And again, people often develop a space, whether that's open space or a, a building, in response to what's around it. And so we're looking at this kind of large scale redevelopment and master planning as a way to change that context so that people actually want to create a space. 
uh, both public and private investment respond to uh, something that is attractive, that is drawing people, um, and that creates an organizing element. Uh, I'm going to skim through these for right now. <laughs> uh, and then finally, on the programming front, uh, the study area lacks a full range of events. And so I just wanted to get to one idea here before uh, I wrap up my piece, uh, which is we mentioned a lot about spilling out into the uh, open spaces. So it's not that we would even necessarily have to bring in new folks. It's, you know, there's people, performers, who might be rehearsing and moving some of those rehearsals outside or maybe doing, you know, one scene of a play uh, out in the Galleria space or out in the park space or out in the street, for that matter. Um, creating opportunities, formal outdoor performance spaces, but also thinking about creatively about that programming and how do we attract different users. So um, innovative and relevant programming to attract new residents. So this is a pop artist with uh, a symphony. Uh, and so, you know, we're beginning to sort of blur those lines between different programmings and audiences. Uh, but using technology, as I said before, uh, in terms of marketing, in, the, in terms of the programming itself, uh, and then really looking at cross-programming cross uh, with other downtown users, uh, with the campus, uh, between the Performing Arts Center and the Con Convention Center, uh, really trying to, again, uh, create as many different reasons to be here as possible, uh, layering on the affordances, uh, layering on uh, the different ways that we can activate the space to create that ownership. Uh, and the reasons to be there and, um, you know, to really create fantastic spaces in our communities. Um, and I think I'm going to jump ahead to the very end here. Uh, Phil, did you want to say a few words about San Antonio or should we jump to the last slide here? I'll just show uh, two or three slides as a, as a wrap up. Great. <clears throat> oh, so I need to give you your screen, huh? Right. So just to finish up, that final element is when you wrap all this stuff together, um, we talk about the program and the space program. Programming precedes design and it informs the design. It's a critical step. Uh, one person said a designer who can't wait for a complete, carefully prepared program is like a tailor who doesn't bother to measure the customer uh, before starting to cut the, the cloth. And programming continues through de the design process. I think. You know, we could do another webinar about how that uh, whole process <clears throat> of, trans of creating the program and plan and then translating that to design or handing it off to the design team, you know, that's a whole different thing. It's one that we did very recently for Hemisphere Park, which is about 100 acres in downtown San Antonio, and really worked uh, in a focused way with the community to develop the program that uh, described the different destinations and places in a very detailed level. And all the, all the, you notice all the IMG words here? All the activities that would be accommodated in each place, like the Zocalo. And then GGN Gustafson, Guthrie Nickel came in and used our, our design brief, basically, our program to design these different experiences that we described. And that is a project that's uh, breaking ground, I think, next month. Um, Chris, I think we can stop there. Okay, sure. We do have some questions coming in. Um, do does one of, do one of you happen to have a final slide with your contact information on it? Uh, yes, I do. Perfect. Oh, I, I also wanted to mention, um, you know, some of these concepts are, are new to you, and it might be difficult to explain it to somebody else. But I recently did um, write an article that appeared on Planetizen and um, HerbDazine.com, uh, which explains some of the ideas about affordances in a succinct way, so um, related to streetscape. So if you wanted to pass on some of these concepts, I would I would go to um, search the title of this article, um, High Performance Streets, The New Cutting Edge of Urban Design, and maybe that'll be an easy way for you to hand this off to a colleague. Okay, 
Great. Um, so this first question is for you, Phil. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the survey that identified what characteristics people are looking for, i.e., uh, who was the target population, how were they selected, how was the data collected, et cetera? Is the, um, is the methodology survey and its results published and available? Thank you. Well, you know, survey methodologies are um, something we get into every time we use a survey. You, you study which, which methodology is going to reach the right people, and you, you know, you certainly don't want to do a survey that tends to focus in on a certain core audience that, you know, maybe you think that's an important audience, but you really want to make sure that you get a more statistically significant uh, sampling, obviously. So, um, and more and more we're using a tool called Mapita, which is an online map and survey. But again, uh, we don't necessarily believe that that's going to reach the most diverse audiences. So we still often will do um, intercept surveys, in other words, uh, person on the street um, intercepting pe people and stopping them on their way home um, or at a, at a bus stop and that kind of thing. And we use telephone surveys. Um, and all of this data, as well as the workshop data, um, the ideas from the workshops and focus groups, uh, they all become part of this huge um, list of ideas that we then start to push around and get creative with and, and also check for feasibility and combine in these different ways. And we find a lot of breadcrumbs in all those results uh, for placemaking. OK, thank you. Uh, next question is for Jay. Uh, the placemaking elements illustrated work great in urban environments. What have you found that works well in suburban environments? Hmm. Very good one. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, it's funny. Um, I think when you break it down to sort of the, the basic components, uh, I think they it's similar elements, um, and so while yes, it may not be a large sort of urban plaza uh, with video walls and you know a bunch of flexible seating, uh, you know a place to gather um, is desired by everybody. A place to walk is desired by everybody, and we're seeing that more and more in our work. In that. Uh, you know, suburban communities or even rural communities with a small, you know, kind of center, the crossroads uh, that we're working in, uh, people are sort of clamoring for a, a place, a center, uh, to identify as uh, that. Um, I guess the, as the community, you know, the sort of the community uh, gathering place. And so I would say a few of the the pieces are um, a you know, similar to, I mentioned parking lots and how uh, a single-use parking lot, especially when it takes up an entire block, uh, tends to be detrimental, you know, to sort of the, the urban, act or excuse me, just the activity. Um, and so you think about that in an urban environment. Well, in a suburban, suburban environment, um, you may, you know, think kind of the same thing about a, an open space. That an open space without the right activity around it to activate that space, um, you know, can actually be detrimental. It could, you know, there's a fear frequently that we're going to attract the wrong kind of people. Uh, well, without you know programming of the space, not just events and thinking about the different uses in that open space, but what's adjacent to them, um, you know, it they can you know sort of result in one type of individual there, and maybe it's um, you know, not the most attractive element of the community, but what we'd like to do is, you know, diversify that so where everyone's welcome and it's rather than focusing on one person or one type of person, uh, there's a lot of different reasons to be there. So I think the core element, uh, just to circle back, what works in a suburban environment is scaling a space correctly. So yes, it may not be a huge space, but an open space, um, if scaled correctly, can work in most environments. Uh, and then thinking about the activation along the edges uh, and creating eyes on that place, 
Uh, so it could be a restaurant, uh, it could be a sh some shops, maybe it's actually a civic use, uh, you know, the, the town hall, uh, if there's a reason for people to be coming and going more frequently. Um, but, you know, and then actually orienting your entrances to that space uh, and, you know, really trying to activate it. Uh, and then I think, you know, having some flexibility, having some active kind of formal programming that you're doing for that space uh, is going to be pretty critical too. Um, and then also it doesn't always have to be a plaza or a park. Um, you know, our streets provide, you know, they're probably one of the, the greatest assets that we have um, from the public side. Uh, you know, it's the largest land holding that any city has is its streets. So uh, maybe it's actually, you know, identifying one block that it functions as primarily moving people and cars a lot of the time, uh, but it has that functionality and flexibility that maybe it can be closed off and really function as a great uh, public space uh, on weekends or, you know, a couple nights a week. Okay, thank you. Um, next one's for Phil. Uh, under explorability, you had legibility identified as an attribute. Could you please describe what you mean by and the importance of legibility? Uh, you know, legibility uh, needs to be in balance with complexity. So uh, an open space that's, you know, devoid of detail and you can see clear from one side to the other <clears throat> doesn't usually have enough complexity to get a person to explore. If you see it all at once, you're not it's, it's not very inviting to enter the space because you already know what's ahead of you. There are no, there are no promises. There are no surprises ahead. Um, and a lot of, you'll find a lot of urban spaces uh, have, have that characteristic and, um, and, and very often you, you need to, you know, that's sort of square one when you're thinking about how to make a, a richer experience. <clears throat> So complexity is something that's much more interesting to us, and it's why, um, for example, um, uh, on vacation, people might look for different environments, um, different countries, new cities, um, places, places to explore on that level, because we want, we want to be challenged in our environment. We, we, we need to have that <clears throat> excuse me, constant stimulation. Um, but, you know, there are certainly complex environments that are difficult, and, and that's where legibility really comes in. It's to aid our enjoyment of complexity. Okay, thanks. Um, Jay, this one's for you. Uh, cities throughout the country are replete with examples of streets which have been converted to pedestrian-only environments, which then died economically due to lack of customer activity, i.e. the vitality was sapped away when all the cars were banned. Are there any lessons learned such that a proper mix of pedestrians and cars, bicycles, etc., should usually be accommodated together? Do you agree generally, or do you think that there are appropriate environments where there are pedestrian-only areas? That's a great question. Um, yeah, his, I, I would say for years um, I sort of outright, um, you know, had this belief that uh, all pedestrian malls were bad. Um, in moving, I was in Portland uh, for many years um, and just recently actually made the move to Denver. Um, and in Boulder, there's uh, the Pearl Street Mall, a, a very successful example of a car-free pedestrian mall. Uh, and then, uh, while it's not totally vehicle-free, there's the 16th Street Mall in Denver. Um, interestingly, they're actually looking at uh, different ways to improve the 16th Street Mall, and uh, they're exploring opening, you know, potentially some of those uh, at least segments up to motor vehicles, which I think may get to, um, you know, the participants or the you know, the person who asked the question to the point, which is, 
you know, do we are we deactivating deactivating the spaces too much when we take off from one of our vehicles? And um, I think yes, I think there's there's probably rare instances where you know a pedestrian mall approach is quite appropriate, and we get rid of cars completely. And I think Denver and Boulder are those examples that you know force me to admit that. But then I think the I think the general approach, when you're sort of, sort of, you know, generally, uh, how do we approach these things? I would say creating great places on streets that, again, have that flexibility uh, would be, you know, our our general suggestion. Um, so, you know, sometimes they're called festival streets, um, event streets. You know, basically streets that, yes, on a you know day to day, they have cars moving through. They still hopefully have great pedestrian environments. You know, places for bicycles, uh, transit amenities, perhaps if it is a transit route. But and as I said, you know, cars and freight moving through there, um, and it's just you know a really great active environment. Um, and I think in most scenarios that's necessary because we don't have the right activation. We don't have enough programming, but Let's say we wanted to do, you know, we want a place in our community to do the farmers market, to uh, do an art festival on the street, and we don't have, you know, the, the the town square. You know, in Portland, there's Pioneer Square, there's Directors Park, Jamison Square, these great public plaza spaces, but not all communities benefit from those. So, you know, if there's a way to think about it from a tra traffic circulation perspective as well as uh, you know, an event management perspective to just have that flexibility to close off a space, that would be sort of our, I guess, the general recommendation for most communities is building the flexibility that you can be car free at times, but um, it takes a rare kind of set of uh, ingredients to make car free work all the time. And generally, we're much more interested in creating shared environments, shared streets. Those are richer, they bring more people, they, um, we can address the traffic, we can manage the traffic in, in key locations without having to eliminate it. And we think it's, it's more the trend of, um, of where, where cities are going and where they need to go. And in terms of just um, looking at those places on streets, you know, I think a, a, a couple more slides and then we'll end. You know, architectural guidelines and streetscape guidelines can really build in a lot of ex levels of experience that are not um, are not in codes today, and um, and not in the newer codes either. So looking at um, the affordances that can be programmed into a um, on the on the private side, you know, in the building front, as well as a complementary palette that. Um, that responds to it in the public realm on the sidewalk and starting to think about the places, um, the high touch zones, uh, the, the, the sticky places for sitting and standing that attract people and keep them, and then how building uses and retail broadcast to the public to make a more successful environment, and how a shopping street, frankly, um, how all these elements can be uh, can be thought of with specific audiences in mind. Like if you're trying to attract, um, again, I'll, I'll just use families with children again, since that's the one I've been using. You know, what are the what are the different experiences at different heights that kids can experience and grasp and touch and enjoy? And some of it might be built-in design features, and some of it might just be working with shopkeepers to make sure that they uh, they put some playable element on the sidewalk outside their door and invite those experiences next to the seating and the shade and so on. Yeah, and I would just add uh, really quickly, um, and it's probably a topic for another day, um, you know, it, to get into it too far, but, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of downtown environments, Main Street, street environments, um, you know, that are, have the potential at least to be activated by retail space, and I think there's a tendency in planning, urban design, um, you know, in our profession, that we, you know, kind of default to retail as, you know, the, the primary activation strategy. And I think Phil has done a great job of, you know, 
demonstrating how that's a piece of the puzzle, but not the whole puzzle, as far as all the different affordances that then can help activate a space from within. Um, the retail can help from without, but there's, there's parklet spaces, you know, small neighborhood parks, there's uh, just our neighborhood streets um, that, you know, deserve activation as well. And so I would just encourage everyone to, um, you know, obviously there's, there's market realities. We can't put retail everywhere. And so thinking about different ways that residential can help activate a street through the design of front porches on a single family home, on, on balconies, and uh, even the design of an apartment building, you know, making sure that the ground floor isn't um, deactivated by simply having, um, you know, sort of an empty lobby space uh, that it has no gathering space within it or, you know, spills out. Uh, so it's kind of the front stoop uh, design. Uh, office spaces similarly. Uh, there's often sort of the default, I think, historically, was to create this grand kind of faux public plaza uh, kind of with a, a dead lobby, you know, that's opening up onto it. Um, so thinking, just encouraging you all to think beyond just retail as the, the only way to activate our edges because um, we need to deal with a lot of different edges beyond retail and uh, how can we use those to, you know, spill out and activate spaces as well. All right. Well, with that, I, I think we're uh, we're going to close up shop for today. So uh, thanks to the Colorado chapter for sponsoring today's webcast and for Phil Merrick and Jay Rankins for joining us today on this topic. Um, so thanks to the both of you and everyone. Uh, have a great weekend and we'll uh, we'll talk to you next time. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks.